Hello, Guru Nation. Welcome to another episode of Random Musings from the Clinical Trials Guru. I've got my special guest, the CRACoach.com. So Daniel mm-hmm. Regit, the CRA Coach, he's got a YouTube channel as well. So is is your YouTube channel the CRA Coach also, uh, Daniel? Yes. Yeah, it's the official channel of the CRA Coach. Okay. He's got. Uh, I mean, we're going to talk a lot about what he's doing what pain points you are solving but just for the people because we've haven't done this for two years which is insane it feels like only six months maybe that we haven't done it but it's been two years since our last interview so for all the new people that joined uh you know we have daniel who's an experienced cra and uh just give them maybe a little bit of a background as to who you are yeah, sure, sure. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be talking to you, Dan. Um, yeah, I uh, have a CRA background. I used to be an RN years ago and uh, actually grew up in Germany. So I was a CRA in Germany for a couple of years, worked as a contract CRA later, and then transitioned to the States a few years ago. So I've monitored both Europe and the United States and developed a CRA training program. So under the CRACoach.com, you'll find information about that. What I teach is a very different training program compared to any other CRA training. I do not bore anybody with ICH GCP or how does STV work. My focus is on how do you organize all your tasks as a CRA. So the course that I provide is an e-learning course. It's eight hours, so it's one day, and you have all that information, all the tools and templates and so forth, and The entire system I teach is best visualized as a a holistic workflow of all CRA tasks. So it's the first time anybody's ever put out a training that teaches you a really holistic workflow of all of your tasks as a CRA. Managing your emails, managing your calendar, tools for compliance calculation, how to perform SIVs, how to do regular monitoring visits. All those things are in the course, but only from a practical perspective for you as a CRA. And within that eight hours, I teach you 10 years of experience in this area. How do you manage all of your tasks Mm -hmm. and the course is available online on my website it's called the asap cra course asap is for as simple as possible so since every cra always loves asap 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 yeah awesome uh (laughs) in an email and you get back to me asap uh this course is the as simple as possible cra course and that is this uh e-learning course that now has what I used to do as live coaching to CRAs, boil down to eight hours, compact, boom, and you're ready to go. If you're a CRA, you do the course, you download the tools, and you just plug in your information, your site contact information for your sites, your patient information, you're ready to go. Everything is ready for you out of the box. So basically, the if you already are a CRA or if mm-hmm. you're a CRO uh, managing a bunch of CRAs because now you're starting to do this with CROs as well, which is actually there's a huge yep. need there, uh, yep. especially with the furloughs that happened pre or during COVID. And now we're mm. starting to get into a, I don't know if we're in a post COVID world, we're in the middle of it still. But uh, yeah, I mean, we can talk about this, you know, the quality of the work when it comes to remote monitoring. And then you combine that with furloughs. Uh, it doesn't spell uh, like anything other than a disaster, maybe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're going to need more of these trainings for the junior CRAs out there that are seeming to be replacing the senior CRAs in some cases. Not in all, but in mm-hmm. some cases. So very interesting business model you have, a very good one, actually, one that's much needed. What made you want to start this? Years ago, I co-monitored with colleagues occasionally as a CRA. And what I always noticed is we would we'd get together in advance, make sure we're staying at the same hotels. So okay, let's write our thing, hang out at the hotel. And I just noticed that a lot of CRA colleagues, first of all, their alcohol consumption was through the roof. I had two colleagues once that had like a a one hour conversation about three different antidepressants they've both gone through over the years and what are the benefits of this one and the downsides of that one. 
And it just dawned on me, not just that that visit, but other visits, how stressed out CRAs are and yeah. that I wasn't. I, I noticed I wasn't. And I, I understood why so that were not, was. You were never stressed as a CRA. I've been, I've been stressed at, at peaks. You know, there's an interim analysis and all hell breaks loose. That, that happens. But not as a general feeling. As a general feeling, I was just on top of everything. And that's because I have a special system how to organize emails. I have a special system how to organize everything. And all of these special systems are all tuned into each other. So I just know where everything is at any given point in time. And there's just a place for everything. And everything is streamlined. There's no faster way to do it because there is zero duplication anywhere in this entire system. But at that point in time, I wasn't even aware that I had this kind of a system. I was just doing my work and I I worked for a CRO, left them, joined another CRO. That's when I completely overhauled all my processes. Then I worked as a contractor, overhauled them again, worked on another contract, overhauled my processes. Third one, overhauled them. Then I transitioned to the United States, overhauled. And then eventually I got to such a refined system. Interesting. So you yeah. created your own processes. Do you find that in Europe, uh, the CRAs there are generally more organized, or is that just you? Um, I wouldn't say necessarily Europe, because Europe is so many countries, you know, and cultures are just different from country to country. What I will say is that, and I know I'm dating myself, but I think I'm just the perfect mix of German and American. I'm an American <laughs> citizen, but I spent 30 years in Germany. And Germans are efficient and accurate. That's just that's just being German. And I went to school there for 13 years, and I lived in that country. You just absorb this culture of everything has to be perfect and meticulous, but also as efficient as possible. I always say, if if you're flooring your Porsche on the on a German Autobahn doing 180 miles an hour, you want to be sure that that was a very meticulous German who put the car together. <laughs> yeah, you don't want somebody who winged it was like, yeah, that's good enough. So you have that. I have that German drive for accuracy and efficiency, and then this American can-do attitude. You know, mm. just like so you have the best of both done. worlds. You have the best of both again, worlds, really. Yeah, again, I'm dating myself with this, but I really think it is this unique combination that led me to say, okay. And I remember when I started as as a CRA that I had this kind of vision at that time that there had to be one way to do this the most in the most efficient manner because ICHGCP. There's a standard here. There's underlying rules for everything you do. I mean, if, if you want to get creative, CRA is not the job for you. You know? <laughs> right. You're working in a strict framework with zero exceptions. We even have names for the exceptions. We call them deviations. So you, that's this kind of a, an ecosystem that a CRA operates in. And I remember when I started in this job that I just knew there had to be a streamlined system. There had to be a way because this all works under the same rules, the same umbrella. And it just took me like, I don't know, almost 10 years, but a couple of years and refining my processes till I then with these experiences with other CRAs understood, I developed a system that actually lets me be stress-free. I, I leave a site after a monitoring or I left a site after a monitoring visit and I forgot about the visit immediately. <laughs> like, are you done oh, with your like, report too at this time or you do your report later? No, no, not with the report, but I knew exactly with my tools how I'm going to be writing the report and so forth. <clears throat> I knew with 100% certainty I'd done everything that needs to be done, the entire regulatory binder review, like literally everything. And that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to, put it upon myself to create a course where I teach this system in a generic manner because again, 95% of what you do as a CRA is always going to be the same no matter what study you get. You're always going to be reviewing the regulatory binder and the protocol better always be filed, the signature page better always be filed, any sub-investigator better always have a financial disclosure form filed and so forth. The patient visit windows, the patient visits should be within window or it's like one, it takes, it takes many years to, to see the underlying commonalities, but after a few years, 
you see 95% of the work you do is based on the same kind of structures. And that's what this course is built on. So I get asked this question all the time by students who are joining or want to join the CRA Academy. And they always ask, and I don't know if I ever have a good answer or the same answer. So I want to get it from you. Mm -hmm. What makes being a CRA so stressful? This is what they ask me. I hear all the time, it's so stressful. Can you can you distill why that is maybe in a few words? Because mm -hmm. let me let me tell you what I tell them. Usually it's uh every monitoring visit's gonna be different. You're gonna be traveling a lot, you're gonna be away from your family, and just back to back visits, airports, uh the deadlines, this is kind of what makes it stressful. But is there like a better answer? Because I feel like that's not really helpful much when I say it. Uh, it's a good question. I think it's really the uh, all those aspects together. You know, I mean, it's exhausting to be traveling all the time. And then, of course, it also depends on which country. United States, for example. I mean, United States, I just looked that up for, for shits and giggles, is for my European, for the, anybody watching from Europe with a metric system is um what was it 10 million square miles anyway it was uh, kilometers anyway it's it's an area that is a thousand kilometers times ten thousand kilometers that's the area of the united states it's really big and it really helps when you're from europe to kind of visualize that it's a thousand kilometers times ten thousand kilometers it's a big country so you're flying a lot whereas in germany you might be driving or taking a train or rarely flying compared to the United States. But in the United States, that alone is just exhausting. You're flying all the time. You have time zone issues sometimes. That's why I always recommend start your week on the East Coast if you have to and travel westward so you're gaining hours and not losing them. Um, so you're adding hours to your sleep at night that way. Um, so you've got just the travel aspect. But on top of that, I've heard the, these numbers in three different trainings over the years. So I just assume they are true that a clinical trial on average can cost the sponsor between half a million and $2 million each day. If it's a big global <laughs> trial, yeah. so you got that pressure on you. You don't want to be the one person on the team who screwed something up and that delayed the study by two days. So you got that factor in there. Then you also have the factor that, especially in large CROs, everything is made of glass. Everything is visible. Everything you do or did not do will eventually, especially if you did not do something, will come back to bite you, I guarantee you. Give it three years, it'll come back, it will bite you. So you also have that you can kind of feel under constant observation. Then you have the timelines, especially also in CROs that are super metric driven. Uh, one week for your trip report draft and then uh, maybe another week till it needs to be finalized. So you have these metrics all over the place. It's not just a trip report, but a bunch of metrics you have to meet all the time. And uh, then it's long work days, oftentimes. Uh, Again, a difference in Germany, for example, with their labor force protection laws, none of this shit would fly that's happening in the U.S. So, But in the U.S., you can have your 12-hour workdays, 14, 16-hour workdays if you're eight hours on site in Minneapolis and your next visit is in San Francisco the next day. Well, you're doing an eight-hour visit. You're driving out to the airport. You're dropping off your rental car. You're going through TSA. You're getting on your flight. Your flight's going to be delayed by the time you get to San Fran. Uh, you have yourself a 14, 16 hour workday easy. And that is something that can just be, be the norm for long, long stretches of time that you just have that amount of travel and an amount of days on site that your CRO requires. So that's just another factor, the long days. And on top of that, you have this moral responsibility that you are responsible for patient safety and for confirming patient safety. Uh, while you have all this wild travel and metrics and everything else going on, you also have that on your shoulders. You know, your job is to ensure patient safety as a CRA because there might be that one in a thousand sites that is doing fraudulent stuff. And if you don't catch it, nobody will likely before patients get harmed. 
So you also have that responsibility on your shoulders. And then my, my pet peeve is, again, uh, just the complexity of the job itself that I, again, I teach that in the ASAP CRA course, how to do that easily. But when you're new to the job, it's just super complex. I mean, starting with emails. When you're a CRA and you're active on a trial, you'll easily get 50 to 100 emails a day. Well, send and receive. If you total that, you'll be around 50 emails if you're in a CRO and distribution lists and all that fun stuff. Well, if, if you're between 50 and 100 emails a day, then you're around 17,000 to 34,000 emails a year that you need to manage. And nobody shows you how. And you have to prepare for all your visits. And, and there's so many requirements that you need to meet and monitor as a CRA. And you have to meet all of them. All of them. I mean, you can you can skip something during a monitoring visit and write up a follow up item for yourself at the next visit to complete something. But that's just creating backlog. So you don't do that for shits and giggles. You do that out of an emergency. Um, but it's just super complex understanding the protocols, you know, understanding monitoring plans. How does all this work? Understanding all the systems. There's just so much to learn when you're new that I think. That is maybe as this last point might be the most important one looking at my own experience as a CRA um, way back when I started is that you're trying to figure out how, how do I prepare for a visit? Okay. And then you, you put together your tools and you go out to the site and then everything's completely different than it was explained in training. And you're like, oh my gosh, but you still have to bring it back to ICH compliance and but just things happen, you know, and you're, you thought you were going to do a monitoring visit in a certain way or a certain order of things you were going to do and stuff happens and you have to completely trash that and do everything differently. So it just takes forever to kind of figure out how to organize, uh, organize your work. And uh, if that is your experience of, of an overwhelm for a year and a second year, that by the point, time that you're kind of on top of everything now, finally, you've made enough mistakes and updated your tools, you've made enough mistakes and learned from them and so forth and so on. Yeah, you for run-ins with a site and you learned how you should have maybe phrased that differently and you just gained that experience. You've just gone through one to two, maybe three pretty frustrating and stressful years and it might be hard to shake that feeling at that point mm. when you don't we actually need to have it anymore. But because your your start into the CRA job was so overwhelming, and I don't care what anybody says, I'll go on YouTube and say it, it is overwhelming for everybody who's new to being a CRA. It just is. It's way too much stuff, too much responsibility, timelines, yeah. long days, forth and so on, that I think that is also a main factor of just shaking that after two to three years and and – yeah, uh, because those first years are going to be rough. So that was a really long and winded answer to your question. <laughs> well, it's important because it's not discussed enough. I mean, you were talking mm. earlier about CRAs, you know, kind of joking, yeah. but it's kind of serious also about uh, having like, you know, alcohol issues. And yeah. um, I I think what, what it boils down to, and there's probably other industries like this, but mm -hmm. uh, I've done CRA work. I've done coordinating work. I've done just about uh, not everything, but I've done a lot in the research area, yes. and I think I think CRA is the most stressful um, mm -hmm. by far. If certainly if you include the travel, by far, I've been lucky to not have too many traveling gigs. Like just from LA to San Francisco is the furthest I go to monitor, but um, mm -hmm. I think it exposes or it amplifies your your problems more like when you when you start getting stressed so for example i'm naturally on the anxious side of the spectrum so mm -hmm. when i monitor and i'm getting stressed i get anxious uh i've heard from people i mean i've seen monitors crying it obviously amplifies depression uh paranoia uh mm -hmm. You know, I've seen different personality issues of monitors getting amplified when they're under stress. So, mm -hmm. have you seen that as well? Like, have you seen that this, and I'm sure stress just does this in any job, but with CRA, there's so many potential triggers for stress. 
I think mm -hmm. we see it more than as a coordinator. I was stressed as well, but not as much as when I was monitoring. And so mm -hmm. I think in research it's harder to find a more stressful type of work than monitoring. Would you agree? Uh, I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. And I think it's because of this, uh, yeah, it just, the addition, it just stacks on top of each other, all these things that I mentioned earlier, you know, if you take all that together and it's all together in one job, it really is super stressful. Other jobs will have maybe one or two of those aspects, but CRA will have everything, you know, you got to be hyper organized. You got to be able to focus at the, on the source perfectly. Although you maybe just had four hours of sleep tonight. And, and after this, you got to drive your rental car through a city you're not familiar with. And you don't even know the friggin' car. Well, because maybe there was a snowstorm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're going to be flying somewhere and getting to a hotel and, and just crashing there. But no, wait a minute. There's a trip report due because a week ago you did that monitoring visit. So you better submit that by midnight. And so, and yeah, oh, there's so also that other trip report you sent. Now the sponsor has revisions, and you already forgot what it's about. <laughs> <laughs> well, you wouldn't with my with my system. Not with yours. A tool. Yeah, not, where not. you can always go back and uh, see exactly what was up. But yeah, um, I, I mean, I think it's really because it is one. Of, it's just one of the most stressful jobs on the planet, probably, because you have all these factors, you know, you screw up by two days, you might have cost a sponsor four million bucks, you know. So uh, why, why do people and I'm always asking myself this, and I rarely discuss this with other people. But I ask my students mm -hmm. all the time when they call me and ask about, you know, um, you interviewed me on your channel, uh, Daniel. So anyone who's interested, just go to the CRA Coach YouTube. You can see my opinion on where research is headed. I'm about to ask you the same thing. But in my mm -hmm. CRA Academy, I always educate the students prior to them joining. And I've convinced mm -hmm. just as many, if not more, not to do the course than to do it. Mm -hmm. But I'm always asking myself, even after I tell them all this, they still want to do it. And why it, the hell do you want to get yourself into this? Yeah, why? I mean, like the money's uh -huh. good, I get it, but it's not good. It's not great when you first start, right? I think I think it just sounds very flashy, and and you everybody tends to underestimate the downsides to something that sounds so great. It's kind of like you know, like Hawaii. Ah, oh, Hawaii sounds awesome. Every love Hawaii. Yeah, but the cost of living is like two to threefold of your current cost of living pretty much no matter where you are. You know, there's, there's yeah, Hawaii is going to look awesome on a selfie of yourself in the background having the beach, but the reality is going to be a very, very, very different story. Um, and it's kind of the same thing here. I think a lot of people see the flashy parts, like, oh, you're going to be traveling all the time. You're going to see so many cities. You're going to be at the forefront of research and, and going to be knowing stuff that the general public, the plebs, will only know five years from now. <laughs> um, so I think you can make it sound really, really great to yourself if you ignore the cautionary information from people like you and me that will tell anybody yeah it's a really fulfilling super interesting job every day is different that is true you do get to travel a lot but you might want to rewind this video here right now by 10 minutes and just re-listen to all the challenges this job has and and there's a lot of them no employer in the world you know that you have employees nobody's going to give away a six figure salary out of the goodness of their heart <laughs> there there's you got to work for that money and and there's a lot asked of you as a cra nonetheless awesome job i mean <laughs> i did it i loved it yeah definitely awesome job once you figure it out and once yeah. you get to the point where there is a lot to say about job security as a cra even though the recent covid shutdown yeah may suggest otherwise in some instances but we'll get back to that but it, mm -hmm. once you're experienced in research once you get like two years five years certainly seven or ten correct me if i'm wrong daniel you can completely mm -hmm. screw up at your job as long as it's not fraud okay but you can completely screw up drop the ball you resign before they let you go and 
in a week or two in a normal economy in a week or two you're back you somebody else ha has you there that's like mm -hmm. job security that is probably unparalleled in most industries right yeah and, and for exactly that kind of situation that you describe in in a legitimate scenario absolutely you know you can't use that three or four or times, you know, take a new job, screw up and hop to the next one, because that's the other side, as you know, that the industry is very small. Mm -hmm. So once you get blacklisted within a company, you know, you can never, ever apply there, you're going to start running out of big CROs after a while. Um, and you'll become known for that. But again, that's not what you were talking about. I just wanted to mention that but in a legitimate situation, that's exactly one of the beautiful things of being an experienced CRA is you can just you can just open up your inbox on LinkedIn. You know, and yeah. see what kind of offers you have uh, or reach out to companies. And if you have that kind of profile, um, 10 years experience, uh, within a week, you should have something new. Again, right now under COVID, uh, as we're talking today on June 29th, 2020, different story, but everything's different for everybody at this point right now. But talking about the last 15 years or more, and as soon as travel opens up, what it's going to be like again, couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Job security is a really, really big plus for this job. So you got the combination of a big salary plus job security. Always in demand. People like that. So speaking of always in demand, Daniel, uh, you asked me on your pod, on your video, which you can go to Daniel's channel and check it out, where I see the industry headed uh, 15 years. Let's go 15 years from now because five years from now, mm -hmm. it won't be very different. You know, these changes mm -hmm. happen gradually, but uh, mm -hmm. like 15 years from now, you'll see the difference. So, or maybe you, you will see if, if the changes are there. So where do you see monitoring uh, mm -hmm. being in 15 years from now? 2035. I, my, my guess is maybe a little bit better than anybody else's, but not much, um, but because it's a guess. I mean, what I see definitely is just more automation. Um, I, I mean, my, my vision of a source data verification eliminator in the future would be tablets where the tablet itself is actually the source. So the study nurse, study coordinator uses a tablet to first enter the blood pressure, the height, whatever other examinations are done that would go on paper usually when they have like their visit worksheets for a patient visit for the different visit types on a study to have that sponsor provided on a tablet it would go into the tablet first, so that's your source, and that transmits straight into the EDC, eliminating any source data verification being required anymore. So that anything towards you know automation, uh, and uh, you brought that up when we last talked, is AI, to have AI look through stuff and then pick out sites that would need to be monitored more closely. But I, I see for the future, my prediction, less, maybe less site visits compared to now. But on the other hand, let me put it this way, maybe less CRA is required to monitor a certain number of sites because if source data verification is cut down, another time killer is regulatory review. Hmm. If you have hmm. a system set up there where a site uses a CTMS system that you have access to, Heck, you don't even have to go on site to confirm that they have all their CVs and medical licenses and training documentation filed and the IB and all that stuff. You could have that electronically. It'd be way quicker if you'd have to manually check it as a CRA, which probably might be the case unless maybe you tag a certain file type so it automatically identifies this is exactly the IB we need, this is exactly the protocol we need and so forth, that that could be automatically identified. but that being electronic so all these things reduce your time that you need on site if 90 percent of the source data verification is automated because it's just an upload yeah uh, from a to the edc if you can do the regulatory review and maybe not even have a cra do that anymore have somebody in-house do that log on to the site ctms go through all their reg stuff right themselves as in houses, just upload something if it's missing. You know, if you see Amendment Four is missing, upload. If there's a newsletter missing, we have newsletter one, two, three, four, but five and six are missing. Then we have seven, eight. Just upload them. So everything that makes that a lot faster 
and just make sure that you need less time on site as a CRA. And that would, again, reduce the amount of CRAs you would need to monitor a certain number of sites. Right. And right. companies want to cut costs, always do and always will want to. And uh, I think it's going to be both factors. It's fast. Three factors. It's faster, the less error prone that there'll be mistakes if something's automated. Um, yeah, and, and then you can basically save on CRA labor costs. Yeah, I'll, I agree. I take it, I'll take it a step further. I think mm -hmm. technologies make things more efficient and cheaper. So the output, mm -hmm. currently the output is we can do, we can give three studies for a CRA to monitor, more or less. Sometimes two, maybe three. Well, if things get more efficient, let's say by a factor of 10, now we can have the same monitor review 20 or 30 studies with the process you just described, especially if more of them follow your training, by the way, uh, in mm -hmm. addition to the, all the AI stuff. So that's going to, that in, in theory, that will incentivize sponsors to invest more in new studies. So we're going to have faster innovation. This is all the optimistic stuff. Faster innovation, mm -hmm. more studies, the same amount of CRAs, we're still going to need CRAs. We're, we're, there's a shortage already, so it's going to be a shortage. Mm -hmm. But now each one can do like 20 studies instead of two or three uh, because of all the AI. And there's going to be a need for more in-house and all, the, all that support staff. Not to even mm -hmm. talk about the people servicing the AIs and all that stuff. I mean, that's going to be a whole other job market right there that doesn't even exist now. So yeah. I think I'm optimistic, although I know some, and we were talking on your show, some of the people you know were saying the CRA is going to be extinct. Uh, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. I think it'll change, but it won't. It. Uh, yeah. It, yeah, it won't be extinct. Yeah, yeah. No, I also just see more optimization because, as you mentioned, it's six six figure salary people. You know, you want to make sure it's everything's as efficient as possible, and uh, and there's still so many areas that are just wasted, you know, uh, where time is wasted, stuff like the regulatory, you know, if that were just uploaded, you can just click through the stuff compared to really having to flick through a binder with like 500 pages. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, mm -hmm. it's way, way quicker if you can just click through a folder structure and go right to the document you're looking for. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm on, when I monitor, yeah. uh, one of my sites uses uh, electronic regulatory. And it's mm -hmm. so easy. I click download to my folder, and yep. all the documents are in there. I don't have to go through anything. I can just kind of see what folder it's in and what, what documents are there. So that alone, and that's that's not AI. That's just mm -hmm. electronic yeah. system, electronic. right? Yep. That has allowed me to spend less time on regulatory, at least when I'm monitoring that site. So instead of an hour, maybe I would spend 20 minutes. So that's what a uh, 5x improvement, uh, no 3x improvement. So now I could spend more of my time on looking for deviations, protocol compliance, things like that. So if we see any changes, I predict, and it seems like you do as well, Daniel, that we're going to be seeing more uh, optimized work for CRAs as opposed to SDV. Because I agree with you, I think SDV is going to be gone pretty soon. But SDR. And if these mm -hmm. studies get more complicated, which they mm -hmm. probably are going to get more complex, you're going to have all that work that you don't have to do SDV is going to be just spent on SDR. So same amount of work, mm -hmm. maybe even harder. Yeah. And you're just always going to need this human factor of having a human being coming from the outside into a site and just looking over everything that there's just so many angles that AI is not going to be able to catch in the next in the foreseeable future, if not generations, um, where even even training documentation, you know, it's one of the most frequent findings in inspections is training documentation issues. And just you need a CRA to look at the delegation log and tell you who is delegated what at this site. When did they start? Maybe they left the site. Maybe somebody else joined later and you have to check against maybe versions of a lab manual. When was it released? Versions of CRF completion guidelines. When were they released? Who needs to be trained on what according to the delegation log? I mean, that's one of the major findings in all audits and inspections is missing training documentation. Um, I don't see that being automated anytime 
soon, soon. You, you just, yeah, and you just need the CRA to to be on site to have a human being who just thinks about more stuff than an AI system would. And also, to be honest, if it, we're talking about the act, uh, aspect of fraudulent sites, the, they're going to be the quickest one to figure out how to outsmart that AI <laughs> yep. and how to behave so it doesn't get flagged. You know, you, you tell a site, we have AI looking over all the data of this trial and sites that don't have a certain amount of deviations are going to be looked at cl more closely. Well, heck, okay, we'll just type in a few more deviations. I mean, they'll just find ways around it, you know, right. just a patient out of visit or whatever. Here we have a minor deviation. There we go. The, the people are more creative than an AI system. So you just definitely need that human being who just also gets just a feel of the people working at this site, which is also a factor when you're a CRA is do you feel that this is a competent team that is honestly doing their work? or not so yeah that's interesting it'll be interesting to see how you know and I had this discussion with a, a with one of our interns when you're monitoring like you're reviewing the protocol and you're assuming because an IRB reviewed the protocol and approved it that as long as they follow the protocol they're following GCP so do you mm -hmm. and they asked this question it's a good question I don't even know the answer do mm -hmm. you ever monitor GCP? Like, how do you, is that separate? Is that integrated into what you're monitoring? And then what's the difference, for example, between a GCP violation and a protocol deviation? These are all good questions these interns were asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? I mean, that's exactly where your experience as a CRA comes in. I mean, after a few years, you just know what is exactly protocol specific stuff you know we have certain windows certain norm ranges or whatever your protocol throws at you um and then just the basics of ICH GCP which to me has always when you look into it just boils down to pretty much common sense yeah I mean you never you don't find anything in ICH GCP where you're like this doesn't make any sense at all because <laughs> it's all based on patient safety basically right. that's where it comes from historically um, I think the first discussions were after World War II, where, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Germany did experiments that caused the rest of the world to say we need international regulations, this can never happen again. So historically, it comes from that place and is was created to ensure patient safety. So it's always pretty much common sense. Um, but I've never worked on a study where we kind of like split that up if there was a deviation to right, say this. Right, it's always integrated. Yeah, yeah. Can you think of a situation, because I can't, where, where the site's following the protocol, but there's a GCP violation? I haven't had that. Maybe if I think <laughs> about it for a day that something would come up, because obviously there's there's smart and experienced people involved in protocol design. Well, I'm, I might be spoiled having worked at large CROs. Mm. I, I mm. know that there's smaller organizations where they hammer together a protocol and you're just like oh my god um but in general a well-written protocol always follows ICH GCP anyway um, right, right. So it should be covered under that that's yeah. what i thought too but in general because there are those cases i haven't been involved with one but i've heard things where don't know how the irb even approved the study but if you were to follow the protocol that would actually be a gcp violation or potentially potentially would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, ahead like 15 years from now, if these studies are cheaper, that means smaller sponsors are going to be able to get a study up, mm -hmm. right? And I could foresee this as potentially being a problem. And maybe CRAs are going to have to be trained at looking at that as well. Mm. Yeah, it would not be a good place for the industry to be where a CRA has to review the protocol from a perspective of did the people that write this protocol <laughs> actually know ICH GCP and right. think about it. Right. I mean, I, I don't want to be too harsh because I know how complicated it is to write a protocol. And then once you got the baby on the road is when you notice, oh, wait a minute, we didn't think about this. It's You can have as many smart people reviewing the protocol as you like there's always going to be an amendment or two yeah, that's why you always see amendments and protocols or in in yeah. studies an average of two or three amendments per study 
Yeah, because from from the start, even the smartest people and teams of the smartest people from different departments can't think around 15 corners. Right. And that's what reality is going to do to you real quick. <laughs> it's just going to show you the full extent of what could have gone wrong if certain things happened. And they will happen. And then, then they see that. But uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd be more worried about this example of like a smaller CRO and inexperienced people putting together a protocol that is not really kosher and it for some reason slipping through the IRB. That, of course, would be a disaster that shouldn't happen. And in that scenario, yeah, it'd be the CRA would be one of the people reading the protocol and should have to raise their hand and say, wait a minute, this doesn't yeah. work. But that's also what you have your investigator meetings for, too. I mean, I would hope that during an investigator meeting, somebody would raise their hand and have a question <laughs> about the protocol at that point. Yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, interesting stuff. I mean, I think becoming a generalist is going mm -hmm. to protect you in the future uh, because specializations will be they're not going to be gone but they're going to be a lot of it's going to be done by machines better than you but being more of a generalist and having those soft skills and having empathy for sites i mean it'll, just like you interviewed me on your video earlier you know mm -hmm. like <laughs> what do sites prefer out of their cras and it really boils down to uh just being a good human being and it never my answer was not and i think most sites would agree Oh, they always find the right queries, you know, all the time. Like that, that's just not going to be that. Leave that to the machines, you know. The CRA is going to be able to do what the CRAs do. This, the SDR is where you're going to earn your paycheck, not the SDV. That's what I always tell my mm -hmm. students too. SDV is easy. Yeah. I could have done SDV in junior high. SDR, whole another mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm just comparing A equals B, awesome, and the other is you got to understand everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you got to understand. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, Daniel. For anyone that wants to check out the CRA Coach YouTube, uh, I'll have links underneath to the YouTube channel and to the mm -hmm. um, ASAP class that you have. What's the website again? Yeah, yeah. The website is thecracoach.com and. From that, first of all, you can learn more about the course in general, but then also you can just click on Get Started and go straight to the course and sign up. Very good. Thank you very much, Daniel, for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for watching and listening, and we'll catch you all later. Bye-bye.